Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to worship, and good to have all of you here today. Um, very excited about the day. Uh, we have Bible Sunday and many other things going on. The start of the, the official official start of Sunday school is today, so we'll see lots of uh, uh, little ones in our education wing. Uh, there are a number of announcements. A couple of things that I would like to highlight. Uh, first of all. Um, I want to direct your attention to the, the fund appeal that's going on with, with ICCES, the Youth Center. Um, it's become clear uh, to the, the, the ICCES board that uh, we, need to, uh, uh, we need to be hiring a, uh, an executive director, a part-time position. Uh, the, the, the board figures it will take about $20,000, um, and that's, that's for a year's time. Uh, and so the boards decided, yes, we're going, to, we're going to go ahead with this, but we're not going to start until we have a full year's salary in the bank first. So that way we can commit to someone and we can make this thing work and that director can get to the real business of working with our youth. Uh, to that end, we have uh, received a couple of $500 gifts and a $5,000 gift from the Episcopal Church this last week. We're, up to, we're down to now needing only $14,000. Um, so I'm uh, talking to all of you this morning and asking you to consider uh, such a gift as well. Uh, we're taking uh, gifts from individuals and from groups. Uh, anyone who is interested in this, please see me afterwards. I think it's an important ministry. I think it has the potential of changing the face uh, of Fort Dodge and especially as we deal with our youth. Um, in that regard, I'd like to introduce uh, Caleb Carlson. Caleb is our interim director. Uh, and he has uh, another Ickes announcement. Hey, Caleb? Well, uh, yeah, my name is Caleb Carlson, interim director. I came in uh, over the summer just uh, offering the time to help out, and uh, I'm thankful for Dave and the entire board at Ickes. Um, just to introduce myself real quick, um, I grew up in the area from uh, Manson, Iowa, farm boy, but uh, God brought me to Bible school and got me involved in youth and, uh, and brought me around. Uh, and about a year and a half ago, moved back and found out about Ickes and uh, just excited about the opportunity Ickes has in the youth in this area. And, uh, and so, um, connecting with the board and, uh, and seeing all that's going on, a uh, major thing going on with Ickes right now is that uh, we're, needing, we're needing help. We're needing people to, to be there, to staff uh, each night. And uh, we'll have a, a, a bulletin and a flyer in the back there for you guys to, to, to look at, and maybe it's even in your in your brochure there, yep. Yeah. And uh, the hours are on there. We're open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Um, and Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's from 3 to 5. That's right after school. Uh, just a place to hang out, you know, study, and, and get to hang out with some friends. And uh, so if, if you have a heart for youth, and you like to, like to be part of making an impact in this city. If there's anybody here, hey, is there anybody here who says, hey, I could take maybe one or two hours uh, out of my week to, to watch the youth facility? Anybody here raise your hand? Anybody at all? Maybe, maybe a few of you guys. Maybe you're a little shy. Um, but catch me afterwards. I'd like to connect with you, give you guys an opportunity to be part of what's going on at Ickes. And uh, I believe there's a, there's a real future through Ickes um, to, to really change, like Dave said, the face of this community and this area as far as in our teenagers' lives. So thank you guys for giving us a, a few moments of your time to share about what's going on there. All right. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, you see this along the temple here? That's gray hair. Kids love gray hair. And we already have one volunteer from uh, amongst the newly retired here at St. Olaf's, so uh, we're talking to you. No matter who you are, we're talking to you. Uh, I have another announcement, and this is from Ken. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the upcoming mission trip uh, to Nicaragua. Ken? Good 
We've all heard the Bible verses helping others um, do unto others as you would do. Helping the least of these you're doing unto me. But I run across a poem here some time back called, What Did You Do With Your Dash? It talks about the line on a tombstone between your date of birth and like on a bag of potato chips, best used by the expiration date. We have a mission trip planned for the first week of February 2015 and we need some people. Um, would really help if we had some medical people. You don't need to be real qualified. If you can run a stethoscope, you're good. Um, we do need to have your medical certificates and stuff sent to Nicaragua by the 1st of October, so there is kind of a rush on that. The first question I'm asked is, is it dangerous? And after 10 years, I can say maybe, but not nearly so much to me as maybe my banker. Um, most of the time, I'm pretty tempted to call him and tell him where the keys to my house and my car are and that uh, have a great day and hang up. So I would ask that you would uh, prayerfully consider going with us. Take that leap of faith that the good Lord tells us to take. And just remember, if God brings you to it, he'll take you through it. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, just uh, one other announcement. I want to um, remind you that um, we have uh, hospitalized this week. Martha Smith, Donald Peterson, uh, Joanne Hillisland, Tammy Cooker, and uh, Claire Wallace, who's not a member here but um, uh, goes to school with some of our kids. We want to keep her in our prayers as well. Let's continue with worship. Would you all please stand? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may join you, Lord, and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. By Christ's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Our first reading today is from Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. After Jacob's death, the brothers of Joseph begged for forgiveness for the crime they had done against him. You intended to do me harm, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God the Father. When your message came to them, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it to be good, to accomplish what is now being done, the, save, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. The second reading is from Romans 14, verses 1 through 12. This Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here Paul helps us understand that despite different practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for all of us and will judge each of us. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat contempt the one who does not. 
And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One com- person considers one day more sacred than another. One considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Our gospel lesson for this 14th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in the 18th chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silvered coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, His master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here ends the reading of the Gospel lesson for the day. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The preacher's Sunday sermon was all about Jesus' admonition to forgive your enemies. He had a pretty good treatment of the subject, too. Went over all the whys and hows and wherefores. He was very rousing, very convincing as to how important it was for all of his parishioners to forgive every single one of their enemies. As his big finish, he shouted out to his flock, so how many of you are going to go forward from this service today, obey the words of Jesus, 
and forgive each and every one of your enemies. Well, after such an inspiring sermon, they were all moved so that every single person there raised his hand high. Everyone, that is, except one small elderly lady. Well, the minister noticed this, and so he, he, he addressed her. He called out, Mrs. Jones, he asked, sounding a little incredulous, are you not willing to forgive your enemies? She smiled sweetly at him and said, I don't have any enemies, Pastor. Mrs. Jones, he said, that's, that's very unusual. Mrs. Jones, I, I also know that you're just about our oldest member here. How old are you now, Mrs. Jones, if I may ask? Ninety-three, she replied. Oh, Mrs. Jones, what a blessing and example you are to us all. That's, that's why I asked you your age, because I wanted to ask you, would you please tell us, all the rest of us, how a person can live to be 93 years old and not have an enemy in the world? With a proud and clear voice, she said, I outlived all the other old bats. <laughs> Probably not quite what the pastor was going for that day. Well, as you probably have figured out by now, I'd like to preach from time to time on various aspects of what it means to be a Christian in our world today, what it means to, to live as one and, and how you know, on how God wants us to live as Christians. We're fairly familiar with the story of God's grace and how God forgives us, how God has been good to us and gives us every good thing. And so I like to focus on, I like to talk sometimes about, okay, so then what? We have received God's grace, we have received his forgiveness, how then should we live? And the scriptures make it pretty clear that God wants us in living our lives to be to be kind to one another and not hurtful, to be generous when others are in need, to be understanding and patient and caring and so forth. In today's text from Matthew, Jesus talks about how God would have us respond to others when those others do bad things and hurtful things to us, or in the language of the text, when others sin against us. He says that when that happens, he wants us to forgive them. Not hold a grudge, not try to get even, not clot revenge, but forgive them. And not just once either, and not just even seven times, which really is a lot when you think about it, but as many times as they might do something bad to us, which is what Jesus means when he says that we should forgive them 77 times. I don't know quite how you see this, but in my view, that's a pretty big thing to ask. On top of that, the Bible tells us that the reason we should be so willing to do this is because God, through Jesus Christ, forgives us our sins against him time and time again. And our sins against God are a whole lot more significant than anything anyone else might do against us. So, no pressure, right? Of course, when it comes to living up to God's expectations of us, we look to the example of Jesus. And when we look to Jesus to see how he personally dealt with this issue of forgiveness, the big event we encounter is his crucifixion. There you'll remember, even when Jesus was being unjustly put to death, Jesus cried out that God should forgive those who were putting him to death because they did not fully realize just what it was they were doing. But you know, I've, I've got to confess here. Very often when someone points to this example of what Jesus did, especially when they, they talk about something that Jesus did that you and I would find really difficult to copy. I'm reminded of something that that beloved character, Father Mulcahy of the TV program MASH once said, in a different, slightly different context, but he meant it and it, was, and it was well put. Father Mulcahy pointed out that Jesus was an exceptionally good sport. And what I try to get across by saying that 
by bringing that up is, is two things, really. One, that Jesus was someone really special. Jesus, namely, was, was the perfect example of how God would have us live our lives. So that's one thing. The other thing I would point out by bringing this up, we're not Jesus. To ask us normal human beings to be as forgiving as Jesus was is really a big thing to ask. Maybe Jesus could be perfectly forgiving, but if you're at it at all like me here, you find it a lot harder to do. As a matter of fact, I've come to believe that for all the commands that God has given us that we struggle to obey in our lives, this instruction of Jesus to forgive one another as God has forgiven us is the one we struggle with the most. When someone hurts us, even in small things, our human response is not to forgive and forget. Our human response is to try to hurt that person back, thinking that that will somehow take our own pain away, or at least make it more bearable. But you know, it can, and, and, and you know, sometimes we can be petty with those things, and yeah, sometimes it's kind of ridiculous not to forgive someone there. But it can get really tough for, to forgive someone of the kind of hurts that are unpleasant even to think about. Hurtful things done to one's children. Hurtful things done to one's loved ones. The, loss, the, the, the taking of innocent life, especially the willful taking of innocent life. Things like that and worse. I think we feel that by forgiving someone of such things, we're denying, if not negating, the seriousness, the severity, and the deep pain of what happened. That we're saying that what the offender did wasn't really that bad after all. We feel like by forgiving them, we're letting them off the hook. And we don't want to do that, ever. That's the human reaction. The thing is, though, I think, I think sometimes we, we don't understand the true nature of forgiveness. That forgiveness does not mean the embrace of violence and hurt done to us. It does not mean giving free reign to those who would do us harm. It does not mean that we readily give in to those who are stronger than we are. I think the context of Jesus' teaching here is, is a real key thing. And the context tells us that forgiveness, above all, is a gift of grace. It's a reflection of God's love. It's not the curse of abuse or the reflection of our own worst tendencies as humans. It's a, it's a, it is a gift of grace. And I think there's a, there are two ways in which that works. It's a gift of grace when we forgive someone. I think forgiveness is also a gift of grace from God to us, not when God forgives us, but that when God enables us to forgive others. Because sometimes that's the only way that can happen. Because God empowers us and enables us to do it. That said, neither is forgiveness something that can be commanded or coerced. In order for forgiveness to be genuine, it has to be freely given. But like I say, if it's so hard to do, then well, you know, why should anybody do it? Because forgiveness isn't always so much for the person who's hurt you, it's for you. It may just be, and I've seen it happen, that whatever some person did to you is so consuming your life long after the event, but yet the person who caused it all is blissfully unaware of your inner torment, going on, living his or her life, you know, either not remembering what he or she did or not caring. The perpetrator, in other words, is comfortable in his life while you're miserable in yours. That person's gone on. Oh, you know, that's in the past. That's behind me. That's nothing. And you're still dwelling with it, hanging on to it, upset about it. 
The effect is that by hanging on to what that person did to you, you're allowing that person to continue to exercise a great amount of control over your life. You no longer control how you feel or what kind of mood you're in. It's not you doing that. You're letting that other person control your emotions and your state of mind. Do you really want that? Do you really want that person affecting your life to such a degree? Or would you rather be free and rid of him or her? The fact of the matter is, if you're ever to get beyond a past hurt, sooner or later you're going to have to forgive the one who hurt you. As Marianne Williamson once said, forgiveness is not always easy. At times it feels more painful than the wound we suffered to forgive the one that inflicted it. And yet, there is no peace without forgiveness. Indeed, I think if for no other reason Jesus tells us to forgive those who sin against us, it is not because they deserve our forgiveness, but because we deserve the peace that only comes when we let them go. Max Lucado once wrote, forgiveness is unlocking the door to set someone free and realizing that you were the prisoner. And the best circumstance, forgiveness heals and restores broken relationships. And that's what God does with us every time he forgives us. He heals the relationship between us. At best, between humans, that's what happens. But I think we all know it doesn't always happen. You've perhaps forgiven someone and they keep on hating you. Okay, fine. You can't control what they're going to do. But at the very least, granting forgiveness frees us from those dark places in our past and it opens us up to the bright future that God has in store for us. It can indeed be a very big thing to ask, especially in some cases. And I would never presume to tell anyone that they simply had to forgive someone. Each person has to answer that for themselves. But I think it is good to say, I think it's best to say that, as I mentioned, forgiveness is God's gift to us. It's God's gift to those who are tormented by the past. It's God's gift to them in that it helps them find peace. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of peace with one another. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. For the whole church of God, its leaders, missionaries, youth workers, chaplains, pastors, bishops, and all the baptized, 
Help us proclaim Christ crucified to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Lord, in your mercy, for all creation, seeds that are sown, fields that are harvested, winds that blow, rains that fall, animals that roam in the fruits of the earth, fill us with thanksgiving for these gifts. Lord, in your mercy, for the leaders of this world, presidents, prime ministers, monarchs, parliaments, elected representatives, and heads of corporations. Inspire them to do what is right and just, even if it looks foolish to this world. Lord, in your mercy. For all who suffer in mind and body, the bullied and the ashamed, the brokenhearted and the beaten down, the sick and the dying, we especially remember Tammy Cooker, Martha Smith, Lynn Smith, Joanne O'Brien Hillstead, and Don Peterson. Heal them with the encouragement of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. For the mission of St. Olaf, its ministries, stewardship, fellowship, outreach, homebound children, volunteers, staff, and council, make us a beacon of your love. Lord, in your mercy. In thanksgiving for the blessed dead, those martyred and those who gave themselves in love, those who died alone and those who died tragically, we especially remember Catherine Martins. Together with your, all your saints, be lifted up in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.